Welcome to Life Bus. I'm Matt. And I'm Sarah. Today, another story of somebody who loves being out in the bush. Welcome to Life Burst. Uh, I'm Matt. And I'm Sarah. And today in the studio, we have David joining us. Thank you for coming in, David. My pleasure. Now, David, uh, you've got a story to share. That's what we brought you in today. Take us right back to the beginning. Where where were you? Where did life start out for you? Well, born in Queensland many years ago, in the late 60s, raised in the Northern Territory for 12 years. Um, and then, yeah, down in Adelaide finishing high school and universities around the place so, but yeah born in Queensland and but raised up in the Northern Territory right do you remember much from your time in Queensland not from Queensland no I do remember the Territory days okay. yeah yeah grew up in a bauxite mining town called Gove so dad talked to the aeroplanes and we played around on the bauxite and caught fish and you know crabs and mucked around and just was a school kid in those days did you say Burke site Bauxite. Bauxite. Yeah, it's What's what that? Made, it's a mineral that makes aluminium. So it was a, it's a mineral that's uh, up there and over there at Weeper on the in Queensland, and it's a big ore deposit that's been mined mm -hmm. since uh, we were some of the we were there in uh, seventy two. So we were some of the first people in Gove, and um, yeah, and Dad talked to the aeroplanes at the airport, and I was just a kid growing up there. Yeah. What were some of the adventures? Uh, it's a, it is uh, the outback over there. Uh, what were some of the things you got up to with your siblings? Oh, well, that's a fantastic way to grow up, mm. you know, buffaloes, you know, introduce buffaloes going through your front yard and, you know, on your school oval. And um, I remember one day we, well, one period of playing in the little bush, we just now I see on, on uh, Google is all gone now. It's a houses now, but um, my, I don't know who I was with, but I guess some friends and my made a buffalo trap. You know, about the size of a shoebox. A buffalo trap. About the, sh the size and shape of a shoebox. <laughs> right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lined it with glass. You know, in the sand, it would have caught a buffalo, you know, <laughs> in our dreams. Right. So, yeah, you know, um, Dad pulled a bloke out of the surf in those days um, who had got um, a box jellyfish, mm -hmm. uh, which we used to call um, stingers in those days. Uh, I had stung him and took him off to hospital. And but yeah, it was a place not long after the uh, crocodile hunting had, had ceased. So crocodiles were around but weren't anywhere like what they are now. So places where we used to go fishing or whatever or even swimming, um, now are places where you wouldn't do that due to the risk of the saltwater crocodiles. So but, you're saying that people used to hunt crocodiles in the Northern Territory? Yeah, yeah. After, when That yeah. was big after the Second World War. Guys could shoot and they didn't. Um, and so they could go out and it was a part of our history in Australia of people going and hunting crocodiles and, and buffalo and, and making a living. So, yeah, the crocodiles were shot down to very low numbers before the ban came in, I think, in about... I was born in 66, I think in about 68 or somewhere in the late 60s, they, they brought in the ban on crocodile hunting and their population has increased ever since then under that protection. So mm. what did people do with dead crocodiles and buffalo? Mm -hmm. uh, meat and hide. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think mostly it's for the skins for crocodile. But yeah, I've eaten crocodile meat. I wouldn't, it wasn't my favourite, but uh, <laughs> it was all right. So yeah, that's where, where we grew up. And I just, you know, we built cubbies and, played you know cowboys and indians and all sorts of games you did in those days and um just yeah went fishing never caught a barramundi it's a mythical fish you know, mm -hmm. never caught one as a kid you know i was just just ignorant of how to do it as a young kid but yeah so we did that as a childhood and then moved to darwin where dad was also talking airplanes at the airport there right and what age were you when you moved um so 72 to 78 in gove and then 78 to 84 uh, in Darwin. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so four primary schools, three high schools and three universities is one of my little stories. Yeah. Okay. Right. So yeah. a lot of, lot of movement, a lot of stories still to tell then. <laughs> uh, what about your Darwin days? Uh, what were some of the highlights or challenges of your time there? The One of the highlights would have been um, meeting uh, some um, biologist guys um, that were with, um, ultimately with CSIRO. Uh, a guy called John McKean, who's no longer with us, and a guy called Tony Hertog. And those guys just adopted me. Um, and Dad was talking to John at, at a church one day at Wallagi, where we used to live in Darwin, mm -hmm. and uh, said he's got a son who loves animals and whatever. And John was uh, kind enough to take 
me under his wing and take me chasing birds most Saturday mornings, getting up early and a pair of binoculars and going counting ducks down the Sanderson sewage farm where everyone's, you know, toilet yeah. waste went. Yeah. But it was a good place to catch, you know, to count Burdekin ducks and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. So I, I I had great times with those guys. You know, Tony used to go catching white-breasted seagulls to ban the chicks out of their nests and out at a uh, CSIRO research station called Capalgo, which is now part of Kakadu. So, yeah, I just had the most. As a kid who loved nature and animals and wanted to, you know, save the world um, in that way, to have that part of my childhood, that was just fantastic. Yeah, mm. that was just the black. And Darwin's fantastic. The build-up to the wets, shocking. <laughs> <laughs> But we got somewhat used to it yeah. uh, as kids because you just played in it all the time and you were just doing stuff. But mm. the hardest was schooling. I was not so good at schooling, no. hence the, uh, the years I've spent there. Okay. I want to know more about this bird watching and bird counting and all of those things. Why did you do something like that? Where did that love for animals come yeah. from? Yeah. Um, there's a, um, I think mum, mum and dad say I had my seventh birthday at London Zoo. Um, cause that's just what I, so she's, they say as long as they, not as long as they can remember, but since you were very young, you had a, a love for nature, but I think it's just part of me. So mm. God made me with that passion for animals. Um, and that just developed, um, with John's and Tony's, um, you, you know, tutelage and looking after me became birds. Um, and then I sort of lost that after a while and became more interested in saving animals and discovered that pest animals were the biggest issue in Australia. So my career ended up being on pest animals. But in those days, it was um, John and Tony were bird researchers, amongst other things. So counting birds is a way to say how they're going, you know, more or less, and finding new species and where are they living. And so that was just research, which has became my passion to, to understand animals and, say, and Basically, my life is about trying to save them. Mm. Did you ever get to see like little birds being hatched and born, or not? Uh, not so much that, but you know, I did crazy things like going on to Lee Point Beach uh, off Darwin with a head torch on and a big net, trying to catch birds to put a, a metal ring on their, or the numbered ring on their leg, a band. Yeah. And when the bird would fly to maybe you know for some species back to Siberia, back to Russia, you know, they could catch the birds and read the ring and say that bird came from Darwin. Now we can do that somewhat just taking some feathers and just using genetics and some other more clever techniques. But in those days we did that. And I remember one night I had two swipes at a beach stone curl, um, a beach stone curlew, and before it flew off down the beach because I missed it. And uh, Tony said that would have been the first beach stone curlew banded. <laughs> but, oh, right. but it wasn't because no. I stuffed it and it flew away. Oh. But um, yeah, we did things like that. Tony had this big cannon net boom net he would set up on the beaches and we'd just fire a net over the birds and catch them and bag them and then band them and let them go again to fly eventually home to wherever they came from. That was early research on bird migration and bird movements and things like that. Wow. So, yeah, just for me, just fantastic mm. way to grow up, you know, fishing with, and, you know, seeing barramundi and buffalo and crocodiles and eagles and dingoes and all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah. Were yeah. you ever scared when you saw dingoes or crocodiles or those types of things up close? No, I remember one day out at Capalga, um, it took Capalga did a, um, the, the guys did a research study out there where they put a fence across the middle of it and gates and you basically would go through the gate and on one side of it, um, they shot at all the buffalo and they basically were coming to understand the buffalo were really bad for the, for the Northern Territory floodplain system, okay. but you had to go through these gates. So I was in the passenger seat, so jump out, get on the gate. And Tony obviously knew I had a habit of unlocking the gate and giving it a couple of kicks and jumping on it and swinging with the gate, <laughs> which on this occasion I did, but didn't notice there was a big buffalo just standing there. <laughs> and when I did, freaked out a bit and he was in the car just laughing his head off. He thought it was hilarious. <laughs> um, he knew I was in no danger. Uh, he wouldn't have done that otherwise. But yeah, it just, no, I was always very safe with those guys and just having lots of fantastic experiences. Mm. But yeah, mm -hmm. territory is mm -hmm. great in that way. Yeah. yeah, especially back in those days. Mm. Lots of adventure, and uh, also fueled your love for for what you're doing now. So when we come back, we're going to uh, hear more of David's story. This is Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. This is Life Burst with Matt and Sarah, and we're chatting with David today. 
David, you have mentioned about going through school and how it was a little bit of a challenge. So share with us more because I'm sure that there are some people out there who might also have <laughs> found or do find school a challenge. Yeah, um, I'm not sure all the reasons why it was for me, but I did have um, I have a milk allergy and that was never diagnosed until many years later. So I spent a lot of time at hospitals with uh, trying to sort out this issue. And uh, so, yeah, part, as I said, four primary schools, three high schools and three universities. Part of that is uh, take took me seven years to get through high school. So I did year 11 in Darwin twice, and I Cliff High and then Kajarina High. And then I did uh, came to Adelaide to, to Blackwood High to do year 12. Thought I might have learned something by then, but failed that as well and did it again and eventually passed it. So, yeah, um, for a bunch of reasons, you know, Teachers in the Territory in those days didn't always stay very long. They hit, certainly when they hit the first build up to the wet, mm. <laughs> it tended to drive them back south again, though, when the, you know, when the humidity is almost 100% and mm -hmm. the heat's around 33, 34 degrees. It's just, yeah, it's a bit of a killer for them. We can see your report card and uh, that your counsellor advised you to, to leave. So, how did you yeah. feel going through that and trying and trying again <laughs> and uh, with that wonderful, encouraging advice? Yeah, it was, yeah. In, in, well, if you see the report card, you know, those um, D's and E's aren't for distinctions and exploits. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's, there's a grade on that report card from 1982 that's over 50%. Um, so, yeah, um, I, this, it comes back to this love of, of nature. I wanted to be a research scientist. I wanted to, to save animals. And I'd spoken to the guys that took me out and they sort of said, if you haven't got physics, you should keep chemistry. And I, that was just one bloke I spoke to, so... Chemistry was a bane of my life, uh, even though it ended up being a part of my PhD, um, which is, I think, ironical. Mm. But, um, yeah, I just persisted. Um, that was very difficult, but it is a character that, a lesson that um, proves to be very useful in life. Uh, and later on we might talk about the quals and what's required to do that, but that's, yeah, that was that was a, a battle. It's, being 19 at high school in, Dar in Adelaide and all your you know, two cohorts have already gone through mm -hmm. ahead of you and you're still there with the, um, yeah, that's not easy, but I wanted to be a biologist. And I'm, I think as a Christian, I think God just had something for me and somehow found some sort of, my mum said I was really surprised. I just woke up one morning and said, can I borrow the car? And she said, sure. Why? And I said, I oh, to go to school. And she's like, yeah, okay. So I went back to school. And that's how I, when I went, did year 12 for the second time. I only missed out by eight points in the first year, but mm. anyway, that's part of my journey, yeah. So yeah. what got you through those tough times of failing again and again and again and again? Ah, I'm, I'm sure um, the, the times out in the bush in Darwin with, the, with John and Tony would have helped a lot, and my family, you know, my Christian faith would have been a big thing with that. Um, but ultimately, a big part of it was just, like I said, I had a heart's desire to save animals, um, to be a biologist. And I knew this was require, a requirement to get through that. So I just had to keep pushing through to, to do that. Um, ultimately, I went to university in Adelaide and studied to be a park ranger, um, which was which was a great course, a very practical course. You know, learning, I learned to scuba dive when I was doing that and very practical skills. Um, and, uh, and then when I finished, I didn't. I went to New South Wales and did a diploma at the University of New England because that was more aiming me towards um, research. But got crook again. Came back to Adelaide and stayed with mum and dad to get well again. And then thought, well, I've trained to be a ranger. I should at least try it. So mm -hmm. I applied and got on the list. And they offered me uh, Narracourt in the southeast of South Australia. Um, didn't even know where it was, but I said yes, sure, thank you. And um, my office was at the Narracourt Caves and I lived at a place called Bull Lagoon, a game reserve with ducks and geese and it was a great place and snakes on my front lawn and front doorstep sometimes. Um, and that was my first rangering. And what then, does a ranger do? Not what you probably think yeah, or what I thought. I, I grew yeah. up watching Gentle Ben on TV, this American black bear and the, and the, the, uh, the ranger in the Florida Everglades, I think it was, and... Um, and in the wild with Harry Butler, Harry was one of my heroes, um, actually contributed an account to my PhD years later <laughs> before he died. Um, so I had these ideas. It was all about saving nature, but it's not. You do a lot of time mowing lawns and 
lot of risk management for people, uh, a lot of cleaning toilets and fixing toilets and uh, things like that, and not very little animal work unless you're you know, euthanizing them because someone's hit them with a car or something and you've got to go mm -hmm. out and put them down. Did you have to do that? Yeah, yeah, numerous times, yeah. And when, when I was a ranger, I went from Naracourt to Wolpena in the Flinders in mm -hmm. 95 and 96, um, got married in Naracourt, um, met my beautiful wife of 28 years there, um, and she was ready to leave and I blew that out of the water because when I turned up and uh, she decided to, to stay a little bit longer. And then a, a position came in the Flinders and we took that for two years and that's where our eldest daughter was born. Um, and that was uh, a bit of a movement out of rangering per se to a job which was about, uh, it's now called Bounce Back. It's a project to recover animals and the environment up there, the rock wallabies particularly. And so I love that. So I spent most of my time on a four-wheel motorbike with a rifle and uh, poisoning foxes and um, shooting feral goats and, you know, mapping rabbit warrens and basically... Um, the bulldozer would come through and destroy the rabbit warrens and just the life that returned was just remarkable. Mm. Yeah. We just saw a picture of your wedding day and everybody knows that I always ask this question to our guests. How did you meet your now wife? Uh, Kathy and I met at a church young adults group. It's called Fish in Narracourt. We actually were down there on the June long weekend um, all these years later catching up with the same group. We all still sort of see each other uh, all these years later. So we've been together 30 years and we ended up going out for the first little bit and then married for, for 28 years now. But, uh, yeah, she was in that group. Uh, I would have met her the first day at work, um, but I got called into a fire my first day at work. I went up to Dangali to fight a fire. Mm. A big lightning storm had gone through, lit up the fire. So the following Monday night, I think it was, we met. And uh, I, I reckon I'll see boring brown uniform with the badges, but she... <laughs> reckons it wasn't <laughs> so we yeah, have yeah so did you like look across the room at each other no i actually offered to drive her home after mm -hmm. in, the, in the evening because it was dark and she said i don't live very far away and i said well and i came from the city and thought that was a appropriate thing to do turns out she only lived about 100 and 200 meters up the road <laughs> 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 so uh and then she said uh invited me in for a coffee and this is where the, the i get get it uh um stirred up because uh, I came inside and she said, how do you have your coffee? And I said, I don't drink coffee. Um, so I just, in my, because I don't drink tea or coffee or beer, uh, just so I don't like it, um, drink a lot and love a nice Shiraz and things, but people would offer me coffee and I would treat that as a, what would you like to drink? Otherwise, I never get offered to drink. So on this occasion, she offered me a coffee and I came in for the coffee and there was no uh, coffee for me. So I'm, I'm charged with false pretenses. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's how we first met. Yeah. Okay. How did you propose? Oh, there's a story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I knew that. <laughs> so she came back. She went. Uh, we were together. Um, how long we we were there together? Nine months, and she went away. Is that right? For four months. Um, so yeah, yeah, we were. Um, she went. She already before we we met. She had a girlfriend. Her and Ingrid had this big trip planned to Europe, and uh, so. Um, that all went ahead, of course. I just stayed home and pined for her and sent her flowers in Egypt and uh, letters, wrote letters 10 or 15 days ahead to be at the each hotel of the European tour. Romantic. That oh, is very romantic. Yeah. Sadly soppy, very <laughs> soppy. <laughs> but it uh, worked. <laughs> yeah, well, apparently, yeah, well, <laughs> something must have. Yes. So she came back and, uh, and then I've obviously been thinking about her a lot and she'd been thinking about them, you know, the Nile or the, uh, you know, Europe and Paris and all the other things and not so much about marriage, which is what. So I, I did propose soon after she got back and was told not not ready. But the family story is that between then and the actual second time when she actually put the ring on, we bought the ring, booked the church, booked the minister, <laughs> but she didn't want to be engaged. So it's a okay. one of our little family stories about me having to effectively ask twice. Right. Not that she was going anywhere. It just was about a, where she was at with her mind after, mm. you know, four months of traveling around Europe and just having such a fantastic time with her friends. Oh, look at this. This romantic side of David sending flowers overseas and <laughs> yeah. writing letters. And What a great start. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's excellent. Okay, we'll be back with more Life First with Matt and Sarah chatting with David straight after this.
You are joining us on Life Burst with Sarah and Matt. We're chatting to David. David, you ended up in the Flinders Ranges. Uh, you're a park ranger. You uh, had lots of different, uh, more adventures uh, there uh, after the many adventures of your life so far. Where did you live up in the Flinders? And uh, I assume you brought your wife with you. Yeah, Kathy and I, we moved up there and um, quite, um, well, she got pregnant quite soon after that. So, um, so we were there for two years. It was only a two-year contract, um, so 95 and 96. But in late 95, something huge happened for Australia. Uh, and for those who are in my industry, that's when in October 95, a rapid virus that was being tested on an island off York Peninsula on, near the coast of South Australia. Um, on flies, it got off the island and it actually hit my national park. And it got to the Flinders National Park um, before I even left to go down and try and stop it. I was asked like we all were because we were doing rabbit control up there. We had um, mapping gear and quad motorbikes, four-wheel motorbikes. So we were sent down to try and stop this virus. And that was a, a life-defining moment for me because as a park ranger, I remember sitting in my office one day at, at Woolpena and I had a map of the whole South Australia and I had all these parks that were my responsibility all the way up to the Northern Territory border. And I didn't even go there, let alone manage them because there just wasn't enough people and not enough money and not enough time. But this rabbit virus, it did that. It went there and it killed rabbits. And on the park, the Icarus Flinders Rangers National Park, where I lived and worked, I saw um, plants re um, regenerate for the first time, probably since myxomatosis had, had come through in 1950. And for me, as a person who loves the environment, is trying to save it, that was very, very profound. And I remember having a conversation with God and saying, oh, I want to find these. These are fantastic. You know, these biological control agents, basically a... Generally, it's a virus um, like we have now where we're battling this this human virus, COVID, but it's a virus that spreads just like COVID does, but it's only specific to a pest animal and, and it's humane, doesn't touch anything else, it just kills that animal. And that's what um, what we call rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus um, do, does. And so I just experienced it um, in my life on that park and just saw the regeneration come back quite quickly. Um, and so that was very profound for me. And it was then at Wolpina that I felt God was calling me to do a PhD. And I remember actually looking up at the sky going, are you on drugs? Like <laughs> I failed high school twice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yet here was I feeling this idea forming in my mind, this idea to do a PhD, which I just thought was hilarious um, and just the craziest of ideas. So why did you do it if it was crazy and like weird? And just... I try and do what I'm told. <laughs> But how did you know it was the right thing to do? Um, you just have that peace. I had the peace. It's what I wanted to do. And that was such a profound experience. Seeing, um, you know, we had, we, I think that the estimate was we lost 3 million rabbits off that national park. There was, I think, 850. And that was a very conservative estimate based on some, we would go out and do counts of dead rabbits lying on the surface of the park. There's maybe about 850,000 dead rabbits just lying on the surface of the park, let alone the ones that had died underground, which we now know are, many, many times more than we see above ground. Mm. Um, so that was a very profound experience and impressed upon me a lot how, how, how effective these viruses can be to save the environment. I just and, want to jump in here with one yep. question, just for people who don't quite understand that what's happened to these rabbits is a bad thing, not a good thing. Like, like sorry, it's a... It's a good thing, It's a, a good thing. thing. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a good thing for the native animals and plants and everything and you know some people might think it's a bad thing for the bunnies because they all die yeah. um just wanted to really clarify that yeah. for people who weren't aware yeah so for, for australian environment for sheep farmers out there cattle farmers um it's made a massive difference to the country for farmers people who can actually stock their land now and get through a drought because the rabbits haven't eaten everything on the stations uh country and for the environment for plants that Often, uh, there's a, plants um, can be palatable, a tasty to rabbits, depending on the different plants. And for some of those very palatable plants, they probably hadn't had any young plants come through since Mixo in 1950. And this is now 1995, almost 50 years. Mm. And that's not sustainable. Um, there's actually a, a scientific research out there showing an increasing greenness in the Simpson Desert after Khaleesi virus, after the rabbit virus went through in 95. So there was more plants. And of course, we're now facing climate change. The 
the reports just come out on one and a half degrees is looking very likely just around the corner and the implications of that by 2030. And so to have um, greenness, native vegetation recovering across vast, huge square kilometres, hundreds and thousands of square kilometres of Australia because rabbits aren't there now eating it, that has major implications for Australia and for the world. So yes, rabbits die, um, but it's very, they are the main food for boxes and feral cats that eat the native animals. So when you, when you can effectively and humanely kill rabbits in that way, it, it has massive benefits for the Australian mm. environment. So, and that's my love. My love is to try and look after Australia. So to see that happening before my eyes was very, very profound. And that led me uh, to this, to this belief that God wanted me to do a PhD. And so I ended up, we ended up back in Adelaide to study the rabbit virus and then ultimately um, I left and to do a PhD. So what's the process of doing a PhD? Uh, is it a matter of just putting your hand up and saying, <laughs> pick me? I'll uh, do it. Yay. Yeah. How, how did that work for you? Uh, it, it wasn't easy. Um, you, you've got to get through into the university system. And so um, one of my dear friends, um, Professor Wayne Pitchard at the university, uh, he helped me to get in because of bureaucracy and um I had a diploma, but not honours, which the university wanted. Anyway, I got eventually got in, and and then it's um, you got to try and get research funding, a scholarship to try and support your family. The first year we didn't get one, so we made a lot of soup, and we went. I had two children, and we went back financially mm. uh, in that year. My wife, uh, God bless her, was just uh, a rock and just helped so much. I mean, she says she did a PhD. I put hubby through. Right. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I did a PhD. Mm. Um, so yeah, you don't do them by themselves. You need people around you mm. to support you. Um, and so yeah, I, you find supervisors. Um, and uh, I had some supervisors. One of which ended up moving to Queensland to the University of Queensland. Um, and then yeah, you you get through the highs and lows. They retrenched my other supervisor, the university, in their wisdom. So then you're sitting there by yourself, and he's coming in occasionally to support you. They, yeah, you. You battled to try and get your research done, and but I really enjoyed it. Mm. I felt I was doing what I felt God was wanting me to do as a as a scientist, and I was pioneering something. I still haven't finished it. Like I still have research that wasn't completed. I you know almost discoveries that you'd like to see finished all these years later. I got my PhD in. I was awarded it in December two thousand three. Well okay. done. So yeah, two well American done. guy scientists reviewed it for me. And were very. Um, generous with their comments um so yeah after all that you you know you get through and you've had a third kid by that stage we had a third child we can see your family there on the photo yes. all right yeah. graduation yeah. so there's graduation when erin's mm. born by that stage so yeah there's a we have a photo of her of her sitting in my lap while i'm just typing into the typing Aww. my thesis up um so yeah it's you know you try and do it all you try and be mm. a husband and a father and have children and and pay a mortgage and um, and try and get a PhD as well. And roughly how long between uh, actually getting started on the PhD and, and finally handing it in? So you started in part-time in uh, 99 and went full-time in 2000 and submitted it August 2003. Mm. So yeah, I had a guy at uni then and he said, you're not going to do it. And I said, yes, I will. You watch me. Um, yeah, you meet those deadlines of running out of scholarship money and because I didn't get the scholarship in the first year, but my wife you know, kicked me up the butt to reapply and we reapplied in the second year and we got the scholarship and then had some living money uh, to, to support the family while mm. I had um, operating money from the government to, to pay for my chemicals and my experiments. And, um, yeah, you just push on through. And, and when you've got a, a mortgage and a family who need to be fed and, you know, and you need to go find a job, to mm. you, you've got enough stimulus to, keep, yeah. to burn the midnight oil until 2 a.m. or whatever and mm. get the thing done. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So a significant milestone to have that completed. And uh, uh, as you've said, um, considering your educational history, yeah, that yeah. was a miracle in itself. Oh, massive, massive miracle for, for Dave to be able to achieve a PhD, having failed high school twice and been told and, you know, not to to leave high school up in Darwin there at Casuarina High. Yeah. You know, that's, that's a, I think, a fair achievement. I think yeah. so too. I'll, I'll second that. Yeah, <laughs> I'll third that one here. Yeah. This is Life First with Matt and Sarah. We'll be back uh, straight after this. This is Life First. I'm Sarah. And I'm Matt. Uh, Dave, you have... Uh, <laughs> I had to do it. We hadn't done it for yeah, a while. That's true. You, you've uh, had this uh, incredible journey, completed mm -hmm. a PhD. 
uh, you, you know, a big part of that was rabbits and you shared, we've got a, got a photo that our viewers will be able to see of, um, tell us about this, this photo, this photo. So that's, that's yeah. what I did for basically 20 years of working on the rabbit virus. So, you know, when people would ring up and say they'd found a dead rabbit, um, I would go and take a bit of tissue from the liver and we would analyze it and we would just like what, like what we're learning now about the, uh, um, the COVID virus changing. That's what we were studying in the rabbits. So we we have probably the world's longest running study um, out of north of Adelaide, and it's uh, going on twenty. It'll be twenty five years this this October, and that's unheard of. Um, and so we have this amazing data set uh, of trying to understand virus spread in in the rabbits, and uh, how it's changed, and and what it means for the rabbit population. Uh, so it's been estimated that this rabbit virus and myxomatosis has saved the Australian agricultural industry seventy billion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, 53 billion for myxomatosis from 1950 to 1995 and then the, when the study was written in 2011 the last sort of uh, 17 billion was the two viruses together and and the rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus only cost us about uh, 16 million so 16 million to get a good part of 17 billion back is, mm. is that's the sort of mass that I want to try and replicate and find for the fox and mm. maybe the cane toad or the rabbit again yeah. Right, so the work's not finished yet. There's no, it won't be, won't be finished even yeah. when I'm dead and buried. Yeah, but even, even there, you're um, you you handed in your paper, but that uh, that wasn't just I'm done. You uh, no, it's a passion. Mm. It's what you just you know what you try and just pray you'll find a solution. Pray that someone in the world tells you about a disease that um, there is a disease, a new disease that turned up in the early '90s in Canada and Alaska, that may be one we could look at now for Australia a different rabbit disease. I've yet to find one for the red fox. Um, if we find one for the feral cat, it's going to have to have like a vaccine for domestic cats so um, we can protect all the domestic cats. Well, that's um, like what they do for the rat. I'm I'm a rabbit person. Yeah, I have a pet yeah, rabbit, as you right. know, little white fluffy one. Yeah. And I get it vaccinated yeah. against the very thing that that's right. you spent millions so, of dollars on. Yeah, that's right. So the Silat vaccine is, 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 was very effective for the first variant of, our, of mm. the rabbit disease. So that's what we try and do. Um, but I do other, uh, you know, I have the animals like rabbits are, are food for a lot of other animals. Um, yeah, I was going to ask, like, what happens with the thousands of thousands of dead bunnies? Well, they just, well, they they're food for a few animals. Yeah. You know, eagles and dingoes have a have a you know a feast for a for a very short while, and then they just rot away. And the maggots and beetles and everything just decompose them, and they become part of the soil. But um, but we don't have a lot of the predators that they have in other parts of the world. You know, in, in Spain and Portugal, where the rabbit came from, they have mongoose and eagles and a whole bunch of species that want to eat rabbits. And so we don't have here. And so an idea I had um, that came in 2007, we're talking with one of my colleagues about a problem where we had, he had studied rabbits and found them as few as one in a square kilometre. And 40% of his little um, acacia seedlings were nipped off. They, Rabbits do a 45 degree bite mark. Rabbits okay. and hares, the only species in Australia that can do that. So when you see a little plant growing in the bush and it's got a 45 degree bite mark, you know that a rabbit nipped them off. And and in Bob's study, he found it was 40% at, at a, one rabbit in a square kilometre. So one kilometre wow. by one kilometre, whack a rabbit in there, and almost half of his seedlings were gone. So that's incredibly low rabbit numbers having an incredibly bad impact. Mm. And so um, I went home and spoke to my wife about it that night because my colleague was talking about a disease and I couldn't see one spreading at such low density rabbits. And then I thought maybe uh, something with the legs and that's where the idea came to me about um, reintroducing uh, the Western quoll, which right. is um, a little native spotted beautiful carnival Okay. that um, the Aboriginal people, the Adni Mutna people and the Flinders were re re recorded in Dorothy Tunbridge's book and for her PhD um, it's probably disappearing in the 1870s. So they've been gone for a long time, only surviving across the whole continent in southwestern and western Australia. So I then spent learning from the persistence of trying to get through high school and, you know, life's challenges. Um, I've then spent the next six years planning and um, this idea of, of bringing the western quoll, um, which the Adnia Mutna people call Idnia, back to the Flinders Ranges as an animal to eat rabbits. They'll go down in their burrows, eat the baby rabbits, um, and hopefully just help to 
lessen their numbers and lessen the rabbit impacts on these plants and just to recover the environment. How big is a quoll to go down into a hole and then eat a baby rabbit? Like, no, they don't just eat baby rabbits. We discover they eat big rabbits too, but they're a, a big quoll. Uh, I caught one a couple of years ago on the monitoring. They invite me up to, to help with the monitoring and I caught a big male that was 1.9 kilos. So that's a very big Western quoll. Wow. Um, and the um, and they they can get down there without too much trouble. Yeah, they're a very effective little predator. Yeah, mm. so they like ra rabbit warrens as a place to live. Rabbit burrows are a great place to live, and rabbits one of the preferred things to eat. But they'll eat you know grasshoppers and centipedes and you know whatever else fruit if they can find it. You know scraps around the Wilpena campground and things like that. But they'll eat whatever they can get in their mouth pretty much. And how's it go reintroducing something into mm. an area where mm. they um, for whatever reason have are no longer uh is it do they did they breed like rabbits or did they was it a well, challenge well when you talk, talk to the perth zoo they said be ready for them because they the females will have six young they have six teats and and they'll and they breed very well in captivity hmm. um the, the flinders rangers national park the icara flinders rangers national park is significant in that it's been fox baited now for almost 20 i think it is 25 years um and that has enabled the rock wallabies and the echidnas and goannas to recover What's uh, fox baiting? So we put out a bit of meat with a poison in it, a poison from a plant in Western Australia. The poison's called 1080. Ooh, okay. And so it only takes a very few milligrams to kill a fox. Um, and it takes a lot to kill an eagle, for example. So if an eagle eats a bait or a goanna eats a bait, they'll just it's just like eating candy. It doesn't do them any harm because they've evolved, they've grown up with this poison. But foxes and cats and rabbits and dogs especially are very sensitive to the poison. And so we put that in a bit of meat, a bit of meat, a bit of kangaroo that, um, and then we drop it out of an aeroplane or we, 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 I used to lay it using a four wheeler motorbike, just put a bit on, in a hole in the ground and the foxes will dig it up. And so there's been almost zero foxes on the park now for 25 years and a lot of species have recovered and we thought that would be okay. But in 2014, when we let the first, when I flew the first load of quolls in from Western Australia, um, my colleague, Catherine, um, my, um, Mosby, who was um, looking after it, we we put collars on them and let them all go and, and thought the place was pretty safe and then discovered the collars let out a little signal. They just beep, you know, on your transmitter, not audibly. And But when they are still for a length of time that you set, maybe eight hours, that tells you it then beeps in a different way. And we call that the mortality signal, that the animal's probably dead. And suddenly our collars that might be on Charlie or Fred or... Angela, whatever we name the quolls, um, started to transmit these mortality signals and we're going, uh-oh, something's going wrong here. And we discovered and we published a paper showing that large male cats had targeted the quolls. Mm. One, one male cat before it was uh, trapped and killed, killed two. One killed three, one killed three, and the one killed two. And we, we published a paper on how these large male cats were so effective that they would basically ruining our whole attempt to put this animal back in the in the Flinders Ranges. Um, so there's the people up there, Catherine and the team, mainly girls, um, a lot of pe people doing science now, mainly girls, uh, interns and stuff, they went out there and they were extremely effective at setting cage traps in the area, putting a bit of dead rabbit or something in the cage trap, tuna, whatever it is, getting the cat to walk in and then um, we will euth we'll euthanize the cat and um, we just continued to do that over 14, 15 and 2016. Mm. And then Western Australia had developed a little sausage bait for cats called a radicat. And we, under experimental permit, got approval to drop that from an aeroplane. Then the quolls really started to benefit. We had quite effective cat kills of the feral cats up there. My record as a ranger on the park was 53 in a weekend, 53 cats in a weekend. Wow, this is with a couple of cars. Feral wild cats. Yeah, so people think that they're just like, people to let them go that well they let let them go in the 1870s and 80s to, to try and control the rabbit plagues of the period mm. they've been there for 150 200 years in a long long time the cats have been running around out there um they're not like someone's pet animal that's that go and they're very effective efficient hunters mm. and so with that use of that sausage bait um and on top of the fox baiting now the quolls are starting to spread yeah and you catch a female and you'll see the six babies in her pouch Aww. and they're all starting to get their little spots come through and they're, they're the most beautiful animals. Adelaide Zoo were really good to help us because in the early years we were catching quolls that had quite severe cat wounds on them. 
where the cats had gone for a, a bite on the back of the neck mm. to kill them and the quail might get away. And then uh, Ian Smith and the team at the zoo would take them and stitch them back up again and care for them and, and then we'd go and let them go again. And so in the early days, it was quite difficult of overcoming these cat kills and cat damage that was happening. Um, I remember one year, I think it was 2016, a, a, um, I think it was Gerardia, as she was called, a quoll was killed. And the intern knew that she had pouch young and where she was denning in a, in a rabbit warren. So they went back there and they dug up, they actually found at the mouth of the burrow, the rabbit burrow, a dead dead little young quoll. He just mm. hadn't been fed. Mm. He was still suckling. Mum had been killed. So um, found that dead young quoll and then dug up the warren and found a, another one. Now, normally they're having at least five or six babies. So that one cat kill didn't just kill the mum. It probably killed another five um, baby quolls. <sighs> So that was a problem we were facing, and that's a problem we face across the country. It's why the feral cat's now been listed as one of our worst pest animals. Yeah, I can see you're very passionate so about So passionate <laughs> right now. Really uh, Great. an important uh, thing that you're doing. So when we come back, we'll hear more from Dave. This is Life Births with Matt and Sarah. This is Life Births. I'm Sarah. And I'm Matt. We are chatting to Dave, very passionate about, uh, you know, we, you don't want to use the term wildlife warrior, but that's really what you've, really what you are. you've been. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, as you moved on from the PhD and you continued in work, uh, where did life take you in the in more recent years? Well, in the more recent years, the guys I work with, we, we got together just last Friday night, I think it was, after, and they've all retired on me. Um, so they all left, having been together for up to 35 years. Um, so we were like a work team, a family, and that was a fantastic place to work. But that all changed. People, they all left and, um, you know, new managers and things come in and things change. And um, I, I, felt it was, I felt God was calling me out of that place. So um, I resigned um, to still have the passions, still have the, you know, the desire to try and find these bio controls. Probably need a um, a rich benefactor to to pay my bills or something. Oh, there's a plug. Yeah, yeah. Like anyone out there? <laughs> Charles Darwin and others in his period would have. Um, yeah, so you know the ideas are still there, like that that um, herpes virus that went through the rabbits mm -hmm. um, in Alaska and Canada. You know, we need to take that virus and test it all. Whether that'll be me or someone, I have a PhD student who's going to start about the start, and, and I really enjoy now um, having learned it a little bit over my. 30 years of giving back now to the students. So I, I, I lecture, guest lecture to the University of Adelaide in a couple of subjects um, and uh, take on students whenever I can and, and help them now to develop their careers and take their ideas. And mm. so I've got an honor student who's finishing up um, and a PhD student who's about to start. So that's just the cycle of students coming through and going out. Yeah. But for me personally, I'm, yeah, I'm, as a Christian, I believe God has a call for my life and I've, walked on a journey which hasn't always been easy but and he called me out of a job that paid you know comfortable money and uh, to do something different I believe and I just don't know what that is yet so I just got to keep praying and waiting it seems <laughs> and trying to be patient that but, must be so frustrating just sitting in this place waiting for the next thing yeah extremely so yeah no it's not an easy place to be in um, my wife is a very successful um speech pathologist in the hills mm -hmm. a very very good speech pathologist so i'm supporting her business um, um so she has parents who have children who have needs that she can address um so in in me freeing up time for her in her business means more children can get their speech issues addressed um so that's very important she's of course the most important thing to me is my, is my dear wife um so i i i'm, I'm helping her you know uh, in her in her job in her career in her business um, and yeah just helping out you know we have a prayer ministry and trying to help people there where they are hurting and you know I have, I've gone through that you know you pick up a lot of kicks in life you know a lot of things hurt failing high school you know comments people make when you do that just things that don't work out the way you think they're going to work out you know um, when I got my PhD, I thought I'd go straight into a job and I spent a fair bit of time on the dole, you know, the unemployment benefits and the, the lady at the welfare office told me she'd never had someone with a PhD there before, which is mm -hmm. just the thing you really want to hear. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, 
that's I think been a time of of humility for David. You know, a bit of time of continuing to rely on God, not on me and not on circumstances or whatever. I just got to trust Him completely, and um, I'm learning to do that better and learning to get rid of a lot of old baggage of hurts and stuff that I've picked up over life and become a bit of a probably a better more rounded David you know without having the hurts and stuff impacting on maybe decision making or fear or anxiety or whatever that you can have how did you get rid of those hurts and because yeah you've shared your whole story with us and there is a lot of hurt and a lot of pain that you've been through and you've you've come to this point now in your life how did you get rid of them? Well, um, I've always prayed. I've prayed for many years. I've led a prayer team at our church and it, uh, that Matt's now the pastor of, even before he was there. Um, but I've been able to sit down and pray with people who have some skills. Um, John and Liz Lucas with their um, Walking Free ministry, that was very helpful to me. Um, and just learning how to pray th um, about stuff and give it up to God. So... You know, I'm starting to learn about spiritual warfare and um, even though I'm a scientist and I'm very much in the physical and facts and figures and numbers and mm, all that part mm, of life, mm. I'm now becoming much more aware of there's a, a spiritual element that I can't understand. You know, people talk to me about it and, you know, the whole, you know, Big Bang Theory versus creation arguments or things like that. And I say jokingly, I can't even understand women, you know. You know, let alone something as as huge as the universe or things like that. So that's mm -hmm. my flippant, you know, joking way of saying there are mm -hmm. some things I don't understand that I choose to just accept. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. where my faith is at. But I've found that uh, through praying with people who have skills in in, um, in in dealing with those things and seeing the issues, uh, I've been able to to pray through stuff um, and 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 things like. Uh, I've, 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 had, I've had my issues with depression over my life. Um, certainly when you get a PhD and you're at the doll office not long later because you've got a wife and kids who need income, that's not real good for your self-esteem. Mm. And um, I remember praying with John and Liz and, uh, and I saw this in my mind. I just saw this hairy figure. Um, and it was just a caricature of, of something that I saw and I told them about it. And I saw it. You can't take it from me. I saw it. And it was in my mind, I saw this figure. But in praying about that, they said that was depression and that was like a spirit. And so I'm becoming more aware of that spiritual element and how it can impact on my life and on the lives of other people. And so for me, praying with people like John and Liz and, um, you know, you guys as a prayer team and others through my life, you know, I, I had a prayer list for a wife and when she came along, she ticked every one of them. <laughs> Oh you know, yeah. I, was, I was, wasn't very successful <laughs> at finding women or dating mm -hmm. women. So um yeah, prep just praying and asking God to find me one was um and yeah, twenty eight years of marriage with the best woman in the world is yeah, you know. Brownie points. <laughs> You're getting brownie points Not right now. Points. <laughs> being honest. Yeah. Aww. Um, in the yeah, final takes... one minute of yep. our show. Yeah. Or if you had one piece of advice to share today, what would that one be? One piece of advice? One piece of advice. I'd probably say two things. I'd say okay. I'd say follow Jesus and okay. find him. And, and that's that's been the be all and end all for my life to overcome the issues and to try and find the peace. It's not easy always with life. Mm. Um, but also I'd say to follow your passion, follow your heart. I always had a love of nature. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I faced major obstacles with schooling and things like that, health issues and, and my early years. Mm -hmm. But I'd say, yeah, follow your passion. Don't try and let things get in the way. And, uh, and certainly have Jesus in your back pocket or leading the way because that makes it so much easier and that's the wisdom. That's where my PhD idea came from. That's where the qual idea came from. That's where I look for all the ideas mm -hmm. and the solutions for the pest animals. He made them, so I figure he can tell me how to get rid of them. Brilliant. That's really good. I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David. So much, so much wisdom. Uh, what a great yeah. uh, passion you have. And there's so much more to learn too, even in some of the things you've touched mm. on that we could dig mm. into so much mm. more. So mm. uh, thank you for sharing with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. This has been Life Burst. You can catch up with us wherever you get your podcasts from. You can also watch us on Facebook and YouTube and, of course, community radio and television. I'm Sarah. I'm Matt. Thanks again for joining us. Life Bursts is hosted by Matthew Karat and Sarah Freeman with production by Reese Jarrett and Kay Hoshra Ozadigan. 
For more episodes of Life Bursts, go to rawcut.com.au. This is a Raw Cut production.